Hello, church. Uh, you've got Johnny and Jess with the uh, Milan Christian Church worship team. Um, we've had to make some changes to how we do things in light of the times. So we are going to be in your living room or on your phone or on your laptop, wherever. And let's worship the Lord this morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching this. Here we go. Pretty good guys uh, we've got one more song for you that we're gonna sing before we let Britain take it away all right here we go
we made some mistakes, but I made some mistakes. <laughs> but uh, that's how it goes when you have to do things differently. Um, let's go ahead and pray before we hear written sermon. Uh, Father God, we just want to thank you for for allowing us to to go through this gracefully. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for allowing us to put in the things that need to be implemented and the things that we need to do to be able to move forward. Uh, Lord, this is just a short thing that's going to set us back for a little bit, but we're still able to connect. We're still able to talk. Lord, we just thank you for your blessings of provision that have, we've all gotten to get us here and that it's going to get us through. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Take it away, Britton. Good morning, church. Today we're starting our brand new series leading up to Easter, what we call Resurrection Sunday, and we're calling it Where Do We Go From Here? And today I want to look at the problem. We all have problems. Some of you have more problems than others. You know who you are. But we all have one problem in common beyond us. And what I want you to understand today is that your relationships are under a curse. Beyond the problems you have, beyond the circumstances you live in, your relationships are under a curse. And the closer you are to someone, the greater effect that curse has. Let's jump into our text today, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and see how this whole thing got started. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So who does the, Satan rep who does the serpent represent? Obviously Satan. He draws her into conversation. Now the, the Bible doesn't tell us that Eve got the commands directly from God like Adam did. So this isn't only a temptation for Eve, it's a test of Adam's leadership. And the first thing I take away from this is that Satan is a liar. Is that what God said? Let's take a look in Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free, free to eat from any tree in the garden. So God actually said the opposite of what Satan said. And good parents do this as well. They don't give a lot of rules, right? They don't make an inordinate amount of rules. They allow lots of freedom and responsibility for their children. I've got a few rules at my house, standing rules. Uh, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. Do what your mother says. Uh, don't drink from the toilet. Don't light things on fire. And don't play with the knives, right? Continue in verse 17. You must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. That's the one thing he told them not to do. And Satan, cults, false religion, false teachers, they take part of what God said, they twist it so it sounds kind of right, but it's altogether wrong. You are born into, in a world that's in the midst of a spiritual battle. And there's an enemy lurking around seeking to entice you, devour you, hurt you, isolate you, and ultimately conquer you. There is an enemy out there, and he's very crafty. When Jesus encounters Satan in the wilderness, Satan does the same pattern. He twists God's word and tries to lead Jesus away from his father. But, but Jesus ultimately battles Satan with Scripture. It says this in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates, even dividing soul, joint, and marrow. It judges the thoughts of in attitudes of the heart. Scripture is the weapon we fight against the enemy with. It's the weapon we use to fight for our marriage, our children, our church. And we're going to see in our text today that's so important that you know the scriptures because those relationships with our kids and, and each other, and especially our spouse, can be an uphill battle. Taking a look, continuing in chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You certainly, you will not certainly die, the serpent said, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Now, it's interesting in this verse, because when it says you in God, in the Hebrew text, those are in the plural form, meaning more than one. Now, the, the fruit, he's saying that the fruit will take you to the next plane of existence, that they're missing out. Satan comes in, and he directly contradicts what God says. You will not surely die. So what he's doing is he's calling God a liar. And at this point, the man and the woman have a choice to make. Will we believe God or will we disbelieve God? That is the choice. People get all hung up on the fruit. It's not about the fruit. It's about obedience or disobedience. The fruit is nothing more than an opportunity to demonstrate faith or unbelief. The real root of the issue is, do Adam and Eve trust God? Do they believe God? That's the same thing for us. That's the question. Do we, got, do we believe God? Do we trust God? Or, or do we trust in someone or something else? We all have to make this choice every day, every hour, every minute of our lives. See, sometimes it's easy to walk by the fruit and say, nope, not today, Satan. Other times it's a struggle. And you're tired, angry, or hurting, or alone. Sometimes those temptations start to look not that bad. See, the tree represents the practice of evil. And, and the word know is key. Because in this context, to know isn't a cognitive exercise. To know in the Bible means to experience. So Adam and Eve haven't experienced evil yet. They know obedience and they know disobedience, but they haven't experienced evil. And the temptation is actually to be like God. See, in the Christian faith, we call you to look in the mirror every morning and say, there is one God, and I am not that God. Satan is appealing to their pride, their self-actualization. Here's what happens in verse 6. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. She did the one thing that God said not to do. And in doing so, human history is marked by self-destruction. When things aren't the way we want them to be, we tend to criticize, blame, point fingers. That's why we have AM radio. All the while, the reasons for a lot of the conflicts we face are staring us in the mirror. Notice she gave some to her husband who was where? With her. See, the woman is not the temptress. She does not say a word. She simply hands her husband the fruit, which he eats and accepts. The absence of any kind of hint of resistance or hesitation on his part is strange, isn't it? It should be noted that when the serpent was speaking to the woman, he uses the plural form of you. And this suggests that the man was with ear, within earshot, that Adam was, was with her. And what did Adam do? Nothing. Nothing. And some guys think that's a virtue. Who am I to insert myself? She's an adult. I just let her go. I'm a good husband. I give her what she wants. But do you give her what she needs? Like leadership and protection. The man stands idly by, says nothing, does nothing. There's a Puritan saying that says, when Adam was away, Eve fell astray. That's not how it went down. Adam wasn't away. He was there. He watched Satan come and attack the credibility of God's word. He saw his wife step forward to lead the family because he wasn't. And what Satan says is this. Great. I love it that she stepped forward to lead. That's part of my plan. To invert the authority in the home. To change the structure on the home. Because governments, churches, states are all built upon the family. And if you can crack the marital relationship, if you can get men to be silent, passive cowards, who sit by and watch death and destruction mow through their family, then Satan wins. Eve always gets a bad rap. When I read that, I read it's her husband's responsibility. It may not be his fault, but it's his responsibility. There are a lot of things in my home that are beyond my control that may not be my fault, but they're, they're my responsibility because it's my home. See, ladies, what Eve should have done it should, she should have gone to her husband. And if he didn't do anything, she should have appealed to God. 
She should have appealed to the authority over her husband. God, my husband's not defending the truth of your word. He's not leading the family. He's not fighting the dragon. He's not protecting our home. She should be crying out to God, and instead the roots of feminism creep in, and she steps up and speaks to and leads her family. Now, a lot of ladies want to fight me on this because they're married to a terrible guy. Because we live in a world where men don't leave anything. They don't leave and love, they don't lead and love their wives. They don't lead their families. They don't read their Bibles. They don't fight the dragon. Guys, if you want to raise children that are valorous, if you want to raise young men who are noble and ladies who are virtuous and have a wife that loves and respects you, then you have to lead the way. I mean, did Adam and Eve get attacked before or after they were married? Uh, because a lot of people don't even realize there is a dragon until after they get married. I didn't even see the dragon until I got married. And I, I tell you the truth, guys, you know what your wife wants? To be loved and led. And the only reason Eve stepped up is because there's a vacuum. They would much rather um, that they didn't need to. Eve would have loved if Adam would have stood up and said, wait a minute, that's my wife. You're talking about my God and you're a liar. I don't know who you are or where you came from, but you don't just come in here and attack my wife and tell us that God is evil and attack his credibility. You're going to have to leave the garden right now. Eve would have loved that. But because the man did nothing, she stepped up. She was deceived. See, so many problems happen when men sit idly by, cowardly by, and do nothing. And I believe one of the ultimate reasons Adam did nothing is so he could follow her lead. So she would get into trouble, and then he could sin after her, and he can blame it on her. Men do this all the time. They let their wife's sin so they can sin and blame it on her because she went first. I mean, how many times have you put the problem on what your spouse did and not take responsibility for your piece of the pie, not take responsibility for your part in it? Verse 7, then the eyes, this is the consequences, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves and made coverings for themselves. Their eyes are opened, and the first thing they do is feel shame. The first thing they do is separate themselves from each other. This is division. Before, they're naked without shame, and now they're naked with shame. And the man and woman realize, I can't trust you. I can't be vulnerable with you. I can't allow you to see me. And the rest of human history from this point forward is all about fig leaves. See, this is still a problem we're having in our relationships today. Anything we can hide behind so we don't have to produce intimacy. And we hide behind all kinds of things. We hide behind our job, our resume, our car, or style. And we give this impression that everything's okay. No need to take a closer look at me. You don't need to really get to know me. I think perhaps religion is the most popular fig leaf of all. I carry a Bible. I quote some verses. I sing some songs. I go to church. And I assume that no one will ever really look to see what I'm doing, see who I am, see where I'm at. People hide behind the Bible all the time. And it didn't take long, because in Genesis chapter 2, they were naked, singing songs, eating fruit. By Genesis chapter 3, they're hiding from one another, hiding from God, covering themselves, not trusting one another, and division and separation have come into the relationship. See, we haven't even gotten to the curse yet, but we see how sin comes between people that love each other, that were created for each other, that want to be with each other. Because when sin comes into that relationship, it separates us from each other. And it separates us from God. Verse 8. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But God called to the man, where are you? Hiding in this context is an admission of guilt. Like, you know, when you hide your credit card bill from your spouse or hide your Amazon packages from your spouse or when you hide some kind of behavior because you don't want someone to know because they might not like you. In this case, the fellowship is gone. They've sinned. They've unplugged themselves from the living God. 
But why did God why did God call Adam first instead of Eve? God holds the man responsible for the condition of his family. Who sinned first, the man or the woman? The woman. Who did God call, call out first? The man. Why? He's supposed to be the head of his home. He is responsible for what happened. Men, you are responsible for the condition of your home before God. Some of you say, but it's not my fault. I didn't say it was your fault. I said it's your responsibility. It's your home. There may be a lot of things that aren't your fault. Many things are a man's fault, and your wife will let you know what those are. But even if it's not your fault, it's still your responsibility. So Adam defends himself, or Adam speaks in verse 10. He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. But there was a new preacher in town, and he was going to all the homes of the people at the church and knocking on the door, setting up appointments for lunches and dinners, that kind of thing. And he saw, he thought he saw someone, but they kind of hid real quick. And so he left a note on the door. It said, Revelation 3.20. And when that person got the note, they opened it up and it said, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Then that person left the preacher a note after church the following Sunday, and it said Genesis 3.10, which is the verse we just read. I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I mean, how many of you, you hear your kids sinning in the next room or being disobedient in the next room, and you go to check on them? The kids hear you coming, and they're like, quick, get the peanut butter out of your ear and, and hide the matches. I mean, it's like little kids being sinful and wicked, and here comes God the Father, and the first thing Adam does is he runs and he hides behind a tree. Doesn't that seem crazy to anyone else? The omniscient, all-knowing, all-seeing, sovereign God, the maker and creator and sustainer of life, and Adam's like, I'm going to hide behind a tree. He'll never see me. When Isaiah gets out of the shower, we drape a towel over him, and he immediately runs and hides someplace by curling up on a ball and laying on the floor with the towel on top of him. And he's like, they'll never find me. That's what I see Adam doing. And then here's Adam's response to God's question. He said, or here's God's response to what Adam said. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? No! Right? This is Adam's Homer Simpson moment where he already confessed his wrongdoing. And of course, Adam's going to step up and take responsibility for what he's done, right? Because that's what guys always do, take responsibility. No. The man said, the woman you put me here with, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. He blames, he justifies, and he excuses his actions. And men are great at this. Um, we'll call it perspective. In politics, they call it spin. And notice who he, who he blames. It's not just the woman. It's the woman that... You put here with me. The man said the woman started off good. She was naked, cooking food just like I ordered. Next thing I know, she's kicking up forbidden fruit, putting clothes on, not what I ordered. I'm a victim. I need therapy. Maybe some government assistance. Because a great injustice has been done to me. I hope that's the beta version. You know, God, we need to go 2.0. This woman has some merit, some defects. She's not put together right. And, and here's what guys say. Here's what I hear people say all the time. I think I married the wrong one. You guys need to work this out. You've got problems. Leave me out of it. Verse 13. Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. He's a charismatic. The devil made me do it. Look, Satan doesn't make you do anything. What he does is he gives you what you want. He'll give you what you want, but he doesn't make you do anything. She wanted to sin. He tempted her pride, and she fell for the trick. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame your spouse. You can't blame the Lord. Whose fault is it? It's our fault. We are the problem. But in pride, we can't accept that. So we excuse, we justify, and we blame anyone else but us. Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and now the serpent doesn't have a leg to stand on. 
Verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and wild animals. You will crawl on your bellies. In ancient Near Eastern culture, there's a mythology that snakes used to walk upright. And the idea here is that the snake is humiliated. You will eat dust all the days of your life. The offense involved eating, so so does the consequence. And verse 15, and I will put enmity, that's a mutual conflict, between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Scholars call verse 15 the proto evangelion it's the first gospel. This is the promise of redemption for the man and the woman. Notice it's not given to Satan, only to Adam and Eve. And who preaches the first gospel? God does. In Revelations 14, 6, and 7, the last gospel is preached by an angel. So the first gospel is preached by God. The last gospel is preached by an angel. And in the middle, we are to preach the gospel. We are to share the good news of Jesus Christ that one day... A descendant of Eve, who's going to be Jesus Christ, is going to crush the head of the serpent, that's Satan, and restore our fellowship to God. Verse 16. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. That would be a better translation. Some of your footnotes are going to say, your desire will be against your, your husband. You will want to overthrow or rule over your husband. This is the same desire that sin has in the next chapter for Cain. So this desire, that's not a good thing. It's a desire to conquer, to overthrow. There is a tension. There is a conflict in your marriage relationships. There just is. Your wife is supposed to be your number one helper. That's what Eve was created for, to help Adam rule and subdue his environment. But now... There's going to be conflict there. Beyond what is your husband's fault, God said, ladies, in you is going to be a desire to subdue and control your husbands. And it manifests itself in different ways. Some problems you have in your relationship is just the result of the way God created you and the curse in response to the fall. Now, we all know women who just nag, nag, nag their husbands, and their husbands can't do anything right. We know there's extreme examples. Man, but as you look back on times on your life, aren't there times when you attempted to subdue and overthrow your husband's authority? That there are times when you were overly critical, where your husband just couldn't do anything right when he was doing the, the best he could? I remember when uh, Gretchen and I got married, before we had kids, uh, we'd driven to visit my grandma Bowley, and uh, she wanted me to go get something out of the car. So I went out there, it's pitch black. There were no lights at all. Found the car, opened the door, the dome light had went out. So I couldn't see anything. And she asked me for this like little tiny thing. So I just brought her b whole bag inside the house. And the first thing she said is, Ugh, I didn't ask for the whole bag. You know, um, and, and I didn't respond well to that. I was like, I think the words you're looking for are thank you. See, sometimes there's something in you that just causes us to be overly critical. It's the curse. For women, points of emotional and physical grief are going to be tied inextricably to their husbands and children. That a, that a woman will want to get married and be happily married. She'll want to trust her husband and be connected to him. And she's just going to be perennial, frustrated with him. And, and sometimes, come on, you just want to kill your husband. And that's why we took those vows. Till death do his part. Look, my wife loves me and my children dearly. But we are the greatest source of her frustration. Now, I already hit men for being irresponsible and lazy. So let me talk to the women. Here's how I see women dominate men. One of the tricks is nagging. Have you ever seen two men nag each other? No. Because one would die. A woman will say things to her husband that one man would never say to another man because he'd kill him. Women will nag man or they'll use emotions. And it's not bad to be emotional, but someone will yell, blah, blah, you're blah, 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 blah. And then if that doesn't work, what do ladies do next? Cry. They scream, they yell, they threaten, didn't work, cry. You hurt my feelings, which is demon speak for I won the end. 
And it goes back and forth until the guy feels like he's in the middle of a tennis match to the point you just wear him down. He's like, fine, okay, whatever you want. Or when they get married, women will cut her husband off physically so that she can maintain power and control and authority in the relationship. So let me ask you, does your husband lead your family or do you? You can't have two quarterbacks in the huddle. Verse 17, on to Adam's um, consequence for disobedience. And this is the curse on him. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you are taken, and to the dust you are, and to the dust you will return. Men's environments have been cursed. From here on out, your environment is not going to cooperate. It's going to be an uphill struggle as you battle to provide and love and lead in your environments. When it's all said and done, you're going to die. You become dust anyway. And there is going to be a time in your life when you get so frustrated, you just want to quit, and you are going to wonder, what's the point? Why am I even doing this? See, every so often, men hit the what's the point wall. Why am I even fighting? Why am I even struggling? See, men with a cloud over their heads, it says you're going to work and work and work, and then you're going to die. And the reason we feel that way is because our environment has been cursed. And men live with the reality that even at their best, they die. God cursed their environment. But we still have the responsibility to provide. And in April and in 2020, it's no different. Every day we live with this tension of wanting to love and lead and subdue our environments, but it just won't cooperate. And even when things are going really good, we live under this cloud of when's the shoe going to drop? When's it all going to fall apart? Because everything in the end just returns to dust. Try to keep everything on your car working for a month. Try to think, keep everything in your house fixed for a month. How many of you have found it's hard to find a livable wage? Right? That's, there's a reason they have to pay you. It's work. We don't do it for free. No one comes home and is like, man, I just love doing TPS reports all day. And it doesn't matter what you do. It keeps getting messed up. You decide to go to work. Your alarm breaks, so you're late. You start your car. Your car won't start. You drive there. You finally get there. You log in. The server's down. So you decide to do some work on the copy machine. That explodes. You get a cup of coffee. It leaks. I just described the day in the life of both, almost every man listening. And you realize you're going to be there all day doing everyone else's work because nobody is getting their job done. And all the technology and tools and people and all these things that are supposed to be under your jurisdiction and dominion don't work. And God says, now you know how I feel. Our work, our environment has been cursed. Verse 20. And Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all the living. Eve means giver of life. There's hope here. There's hope that a son is going to come at some point and through the birth of this woman and her daughters, crush the serpent, restore their fellowship with God. Verse 21. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve, for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. Even though they messed up, see how God still cares for them? He's, he's concerned for their welfare. Right? He covers their nakedness. And, and since God made the clothes out of animal skin, many theologians view this as the first sacrifice for sin, the first blood covering of sin. And you know the rest of the story. They're banished from the garden, not because he hates us, because he loves us. God doesn't want you to sin forever. He says, I would rather have you die. That way I can resurrect you and start all over. I would rather go that route than allow you to sin forever and be separated from me forever. So they're cast out of the garden and the tree of heaven, go, the tree of life goes back into heaven and it doesn't come down until the book of Revelation. See, the two environments where we should be the most 
successful, right? Our relationships and our work, our families and our work have been cursed. I remember when Leah was in preschool, she was riding home, uh, she was playing outside, and she fell and cut her knee pretty bad, and she needed a Band-Aid. Now, normally, uh, we go through Band-Aids like, like, I mean, just, we go through them, a lot of them, tons of them. And I went to go grab a Band-Aid and put her on her, and she says, no, I don't want a Band-Aid. And I'm like, honey, you got a pretty good scrape. You, you need a Band-Aid. And she looked at me and says, I don't want a Band-Aid. I'd look silly. I'd look stupid. That's what she said. I thought, who told you you'd look stupid? We live on a, almost a virtually dead-end street. No one was around. Nobody was out there. It was just me, her, and her brother. See, to me, Genesis chapter 3, verse 11 is one of the saddest and most profoundly beautiful verses in the entire Bible. Who told you you were naked? Adam and Eve have fallen. The apples of core. The snake has spoken. The dreams appear crushed. And they hide from God under clothes hastily sewn together. And he appears and he asks them one simple question. Who told you you were naked? There's hurt in God's voice as he asks this question. But also a deep sadness. The sense of a father holding a daughter who for the first time has wrapped herself in shame. Who told you you weren't loved? Who told you you were ugly? Who told you that your dreams were foolish? Who told you you would never have a child? Who told you you would never be a good father? Who told you you weren't a good mother? Who told you that this life was all there is? Who told you you were naked? I don't know when you discovered shame. I don't know what lies you've been told by other people or maybe even that you've told yourself. But in response to what you're hearing from everyone else, God is still asking that same question. Who told you you were naked? And he's still asking us that question because we're not. In Christ, we're not worthless. In Christ, we're not hopeless. In Christ, we're not dumb or ugly or forgotten. In Christ, we're not naked. Isaiah 61.10 says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Look, the world may try to tell you a thousand different things today when you leave here. And you're going to hear a million declarations of what you are or who you'll always be. But know this, as unbelievable as it sounds, and as much as I never expected to say this and get it broadcast on the internet, you're not naked. So where do we go from here? That's the problem. If you want to see the price for this problem to be fixed, you got to tune in next week. Now in a moment, we're going to take communion together. And I know that no one is here in this building with me. It's just me uh, videoing this. But see, that's the awesome part about communion is we don't have to be in the same place. Us being one or us being together isn't about the proximity of our physical bodies. Us being together is about who we are in Christ. That if you're in Christ out there in Sherrard and you're in Christ in Andalusia and I'm in Christ here in Milan and you're in Christ in, in, in Davenport, then we're all in Christ together. And let's remember the reason we take communion. It's to remember Jesus Christ, his blood that was shed for us, his body that was broken for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, you're an amazing and awesome God. And I pray that you would forgive us of our sins, our irresponsibility. God, that you would help us to clothe ourselves in Christ and follow you. Lord, I pray for the men watching this, Lord, that they would love and lead their families. God, and I pray for, for the women watching this, God, that you would bless them, that they would be a helper, and that we would all grow closer together by growing closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, in a moment, we're going to take up an offering. Uh, if this is your, if you're a guest with us, if this is in your home church, thanks for watching. I hope this was uh, a blessing to you. But if Milan Christian Church is your home church, 
could you please click click the link below this video on online giving? I know people were having a bunch of problem with that last week. We were working with Stewardship Technologies. We got that figured out. If you don't feel comfortable giving online but still want to give, you can you can mail your, your offerings to the church. And now the church also has a P.O. box that you can mail those offerings to. God bless you. I'm praying for you. We are going to get through this. Sometimes people ask me, well, where is God in this? Why is God allowing this to happen? Man, I want you to know. God is still on his throne. God is still in the same place he was when his son was beaten and crucified in our place for our sins. And my faith, my trust, and my hope is in him.